This podcast is sponsored by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Student Conservation Association. The goal for these short podcast episodes is to really create a window into the conservation and the educational work that's being done on the Yukon Delta National Wildlife Refuge. My name is Elise Brunk. I'm from Portland, Oregon, and I just graduated from Trinity University, where I studied molecular biology and art. And I'm Emma St. John. I'm from Montclair, New Jersey, and I'm a rising senior at Mount Holyoke College studying geography and geology. We're both visitor services interns from the Student Conservation Association, also known as the SCA. The SCA has volunteer and paid employment programs designed for high school students, college students, and recent graduates. They partner with state and federal organizations providing internships all across the United States, and all of their programs are focused on conservation. We are working in the town of Bethel on the Yukon Delta Wildlife Refuge, which is in southwest Alaska. Bethel is actually the largest western town in Alaska. Bethel is home to about 6,000 people, and the entire region has a population of about 25,000 spread across 50 villages. The whole refuge covers just over 19 million acres, so it's quite large. And one of the interesting things about it is that it's not continuous. There are pockets of state and private land within the refuge, as well as wilderness areas. The physical land itself isn't exactly continuous either. Over half of the refuge area is covered by water, and you can really see this on any map of the area. It's a really incredible and unique landscape that constantly changes since so many of the lakes and ponds in the areas are ephemeral. So if you go hiking on the tundra, you might kind of get wet feet. We definitely got wet feet last time, so we wore the wrong shoes. Our job is basically to work in the Refuge Visitor Center, um, not out in the field. So we staff the front desks on the days that the Visitor Center is open to the public. And we also lead educational outreach projects in Bethel. And we generate social media content for the Refuge. So that's Facebook posts um, and talking on the radio. And we also get to help organize ed- environmental education materials um, that are within the refuge's p- possession so that they can be implemented um, and shared with local groups like schools across the region. So this is the very first episode in this podcast. If you're hearing this, you haven't missed anything. And be sure to tune in for our next episodes. Over the next few episodes, we'll be having other staff members talk about their work and their experiences on the refuge. This one's just us. Uh, We could talk for a while about what we've been doing this summer, and we want to share what we did up at the Quidlick Fishing Weir a couple weeks ago. But before we get into everything that we were doing up there, I'm going to ask, what's a weir anyway? uh, We certainly didn't know before we got here, so if you're wondering, we really can't blame you. Emma, what's a weir? All right, great question. A weir is essentially a fence across a section of a river that larger fish, like salmon, which are targeted at the Quidlick Weir, can't pass through, so they're all directed to one entrance with a tunnel through the middle. Upstream of the weir, there is a wooden trap that fish congregate in when the door is closed. The door of the trap is only closed for a few hours of the day when workers at the weir are planning to take more detailed sampling, age, sex, and length data. When the trap is open, fish can freely pass through the weir, and their passage is recorded on video camera and then counted by species. Yeah, so Emma and I got to spend three days up at the weir Uh, So we got a little taste of what it's like to work there for a full season, Um, and that's just the summer, really, a couple months. It's a well-established camp, and it's been in use seasonally for years, so they have a number of canvas tents complete with little wood stoves in them, which is super cozy, Um, and they have a good kitchen set up, and it's all on these raised platforms. Probably the most exciting part for both of us at the weir was getting to do the age sex length data also called ASL with the actual fish in the weir trap so we went into the water wearing dry suits so it wasn't too cold and we were inside the trap itself which has an open top and just bars on the side and it holds the fish while the doors are closed it's big enough to fit the both of us at the same time so we and we were uh, armed with this large uh hand net like maybe two feet by two feet and we would both stand at one end the upstream end of the trap and then hustle down to the other end holding the net in sync together and then try to scoop up whatever fish we could get and when we pulled one up we would sit it in this little um, sling on the side of the trap and from there we can measure it easily um, get a good enough look at it to tell the species and the sex and then lastly take a couple of scales um, from the side of the fish and they use those to determine age actually Uh, the scales have this sort of ringed banded formation if you look at them under a microscope, kind of like tree rings. So that gives you their age. 
So that was a really neat experience. Um, and we were both a little tentative at first because you have this big fish. The largest one was... 84 centimeters. Yeah. It was a big pregnant Chinook. 84 centimeters. And they're splashing everywhere. So it was a really cool experience to get to contribute to that kind of research. Yeah. I had actually never been fishing before in my life. I've never held a fish. Oh, wow. Um, So that was really exciting. What a way to start. Exactly. Yeah. Right into the deep end. (laughs) No pun intended. The next day, the weather was really bad, so we didn't work in the weir trap. Um, Instead, one of the weir techs there taught us how to count salmon from the camera recordings, because they actually have a camera set up um, in the spot where the fish have to pass through this, like, one little channel. So they get to see everything that moves through there. Um, It's like, like a motion sensor. So we learned how to identify the different species of salmon by this black and white camera recording, which was really a challenge. We made lots of mistakes at first. So at that time, which was about mid-July, there were chum, sockeye, chinook, and pink salmon all moving through the weir. These fish were all moving through the same part of their life cycle. To learn more about salmon life cycles, we asked Aaron Weber. He's the current acting deputy refuge manager here. Prior to this position, he was the fisheries biologist, and he worked at the Quithlick Weir for many years. So he's the one to ask. Here's Aaron. Here at the Yukon Delta National Wildlife Refuge, we have five Pacific salmon species. They're the Chinook, Sockeye, Chum, Pink, and Coho. Basically, the life history of a salmon is that they're anadromous, which means they spawn in freshwater, go and live in the ocean for a time, and then return to the same place that they were hatched to spawn and die. And so that's basically what happens. The eggs hatch sometime in the winter. They emerge as very, very small fish, larval fish, and they can spend anywhere from months to years in the freshwater before they go out to the ocean. When they are in the ocean, they can spend anywhere from one to seven years, depending on species, and then they return back to where they were hatched. And so that life history is really, it ranges depending on what species it is and all sorts of different things like environmental conditions, temperature, uh, water, flood. But that's basically what happens. You hatch, you go to the ocean, you get big, you come back, and you spawn and die. So that's a summary of life as a salmon. As the fish migrate from the ocean to freshwater, their appearance changes and it diverges between species so that they start to look more different. Before, when they're all ocean-going, all of the five species look more or less the same. We learn to identify them from their spawning colors, patterns, and shapes. And we also learn to identify or tell the difference between males and females. Male salmon have a distinctive hook or curve on their lower jaw, which develops just prior to their migration to spawning grounds. This physical feature is called a kipe. Yeah, being able to tell the males from the females was pretty straightforward when we were actually in the trap itself handling the fish, but definitely more difficult to determine doing the video recording, but that's actually not essential data. They're just counting the number of fish per species. We were just testing ourselves mostly. Yeah, so they use that data to supplement the data that they get from actually physically being in the weir and handling the fish. Um, And if you're interested in this, I believe there's a YouTube video um, on the Yukon Delta weir. Now that we've talked about what a weir is, you might still be wondering what the point of all this is and why we have people doing this work in the first place. The purpose of weirs is to estimate annual escapement numbers for salmon runs. Escapement is the number of fish who complete their migration to their spawning grounds, those who are not fished and don't pass away from other causes. The Quithlick Weir and other weirs are strategically placed in tributaries upstream from where most fishing occurs, so human pressures are not too much of a factor after they're counted. All in all, the weir is a fascinating and important operation that enables biologists to measure the strength of the salmon runs and better understand the human and the environmental pressures on these fish. Our time there was a really, truly memorable part of our internship on this refuge. In closing, we'd like to thank the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Student Conservation Association for these wonderful opportunities and for the hard work of all their employees.